Hello everyone. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week in our study we were in Colossians chapter 2 and I would encourage you to get a Bible and go to Colossians chapter 2 again for the second part of a study I've entitled Nothing Lacking. There were false teachers that were creeping into the early church that in various ways were diminishing the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It was an attack of the gospel. Uh, they were also teaching that if you wanted to be among the, the elite believers, you needed to then kind of prescribe to their particular twists on dietary laws, uh, certain ceremonies that they, they were promoting. Uh, you were going to have to have some kind of a spiritual experience. They were just adding all of these things uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul's concern for the church at Colossae was for their spiritual growth. Uh, we saw this last week in verse 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted, built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. He wants them to grow, to mature in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And he says, as you've received Christ, walk in him, be rooted, built up in him. Established, firmly established in the faith. He's just saying, look, I want you to mature. But his secondary concern, and the reason that he's mentioning that, is because some false teaching had begun to infiltrate the early church and he was concerned that what this teaching was going to do was derail the spiritual growth that they were to experience in Christ. It was going to diminish their faith, their trust in the sufficiency of Christ to give them everything they needed to continue to grow and mature in their faith. There were things being added to the gospel message and it is no different than our, it is in our day. We still have people that get on our television sets and proclaim a false gospel saying that you need Christ plus you need to experience this or do this or you, you must be involved with this thing. And it just seems to be no end. Paul follows um, this desire for them to grow with this warning in verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So he gives this warning. There are people who were coming in who would love to get you on a tangent give you some bad philosophy. They want to cheat you with empty deceit. And it's according to the pr principles of the traditions of men, not according to Christ. In other words, they're not backing any of this up with Bible. They may be trying to pull some verses here and there, but in the overall context, they don't fit. And people do that today. Paul warned in another place, beware of those who twist the scriptures to the destruction of their own souls. And so Paul follows that warning in verse 9 with this unwavering doctrinal truth. Verse 9, for in him that is in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. As fully God and fully man, Christ then is absolutely unique among humanity. He's the only begotten of the Father. There has never been, nor will there ever be, anyone like our Lord Jesus Christ. He is not only unique, but he is also then to be supreme. If we're to grow in Christ's likeness, to mature in our faith, then we must always maintain a high view of of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The false teaching that was infiltrating the church, folks, caused people to focus more 
on external experiences like keeping dietary rules or observing religious festivals or by seeking some subjective spiritual experience like worshiping angels. The combination of those things would lead people to pursue a thing rather than pursue a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is teaching here that you don't need Christ plus an experience. You don't need Christ plus some religious event to have everything that you need as a believer. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is simply saying Jesus is God, fully God. And because of that, folks, then we can determine that not only is he unique and not only is he supreme, but thirdly, Christ is absolutely sufficient for everything we need. He's sufficient. Look at verse 10. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In other words, Paul is simply saying look, this. You lack nothing in Christ. When you're in Christ, he is sufficient for everything. You don't have to add anything to him. Verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. There's, there's not a religious ceremony. You're, you're circumcised without the circumcision made without hands by putting off the, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The, the word fullness back in verse 9 is a word that denotes completeness. Christ gives us himself completely. In Christ we lack nothing. And we can then say, because we have received him in his fullness, we lack nothing. When we have Christ, we do not need anything or anyone else. Now, wouldn't you agree then that Christ is sufficient? First of all, for your salvation. Let's just start there. Christ is sufficient for your salvation because Jesus is who he is. He is sufficient for our salvation. He is the only one who could supply the perfect life that was needed. He is the only one who could supply the perfect righteousness that we need applied to our account. Think about this. Jesus is the only one whose life and position is valuable enough to secure salvation of anyone who would put their trust in him. You see, Jesus took our place, didn't he? He took the penalty that we deserved, his death, because of his death. We are set free. Now, some people are trying to just get into heaven by living a better life. They are hoping that by doing some, some good things, they might be able to squeeze into heaven by the skin of their teeth. They see involvement in church and in religious things as the key uh, to eternity. Others are convinced that, that you just need to think more positively. If you could only have a better self-esteem, then you believe God would let you into heaven. You see, positive thinking is what some people are trusting in to get them into heaven. Others are seeking some kind of experience. If only you could be slain in the Spirit, whatever that is. There's not a verse in the Bible that even speaks of that, but it's a popular thought today. If only you could feel the tingle in your spirit, experience that. If only you could speak in tongues. If you could have these experiences, they think, then you would be one of God's children and God would redeem you and use you. And they see experience as the key to eternity. But I would say to you, without any hesitation, all of those things are perverted thinking. 
We need nothing more than Christ. His work is sufficient. The work he accomplished was something we could not have done. He did what we could not. He, he listen, he did not do the job part way, did he? No, his sacrifice was sufficient for our salvation. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what your, your family or your friends may say, what Jesus did for you and I is enough. It's enough. He is sufficient for you to be saved and for you to know his fullness in your life. You lack nothing in Christ. He offers you eternal life. What you must do is trust him for that, right? It's more than reciting the truth or, or saying a prayer. It's more than having an experience. It's a matter of placing all of your confidence for eternity on what Christ has done for you. It's saying essentially this, Lord, I, I cannot be good enough. I know that on my own I have never done anything to merit salvation. Today I believe, I cling to and rely on your promise that if I would believe, I could be saved. It's all on Christ. And you don't add anything to that. The key question is this, do you believe the promise? He has done enough, folks. His sacrifice is sufficient. The question is, will we trust that? But Christ is not only sufficient for our salvation, but we know also that he's sufficient for all, all of our daily needs. We don't lack anything in Christ. Wouldn't life be great if you knew that you would survive and grow from all the difficulties of your life? Wouldn't life be easier if you could just be sure that you're, you were going to be able to meet the uncertainties of the future? Wouldn't life be far more enjoyable if you knew you were headed in the right direction all the time? Yes, of course life would be. But how many nights do you toss and turn, fretting, unable to sleep because of the things that are engulfing your mind with work? How many times do you, you look at your bills and then look at your budget and just wonder, how in the world am I going to survive? How many times do you face major decisions and feel paralyzed because you just don't want to make the wrong decision? The answer to these problems is Jesus. The Bible says in so many different ways, Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all of your needs, not all of your greeds, all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that promise? Are you living in light of that promise? If God is for us, who can be against us? For I am convinced, Paul writes, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor the present or the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. James wrote this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without finding fault, and it will be given to him. James 1.5 and then Paul in the book of Philippians says this, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, Christ is sufficient for all of our needs. He supplies all of our needs. You're lacking wisdom? Let him ask of God. You're lacking peace? He says, don't be anxious about anything, but when everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you can know that God's going to supply all of your needs because here's what the word says in Romans 8, 28, that God is able to work all things together for good to those who love him 
and those who have been called according to his purpose. The message is simple. Oh, it's been convoluted by some, but the message basically boils down to this. Trust Christ. You lack nothing in him, so trust him for it. It's the key to victory and blessing in the Christian life is simply to trust him. Believe the promises of God. When anxiety seizes you, and we're living in a day where there's no lack of anxiety, but if it begins to seize your heart, when fear grips your heart, when churning keeps you awake at night, trust Jesus. In this day and age when we are confused by all kinds of people who say the answer is Jesus and, I'm here to remind you folks, the Bible says that Jesus is the answer, period. Trust him. He's the one. He's the one who can provide what you need for eternal life. He's the one who will equip your life. He is the one who will see you through the hard times that we're in right now. He is the one who gives you everything you need for every situation. He is the one who can calm the churning of your heart. You see, living the Christian life, it's not a, it's not a mystery, folks. It's a person. He's the answer to life. The question you must answer is this, on what am I placing my hope and my trust in these days of uncertainty in which we live. On your experiences? Are you trusting your experiences? Are you trusting your church? Maybe you're leaning on your past achievements or how you compare to others. But I say to you, in Him we are complete. We must put our trust in the absolute sufficiency of the person of Christ and the work that he accomplished. He left nothing undone. There's nothing, folks, he left undone. When we consider the greatness of his person, who he is, and all that he's done for us, his ongoing work of salvation, then let us not in any way diminish his greatness by trying to add something to it as though we could improve upon it. We are complete in him. That means we lack nothing at all. And that's great news to live by. May the Lord bless you. Have a good, and more importantly, have a godly week. God bless you.